Yes? McKinley, what are you doing? Going to the what? Oh, Tool Concert. Good. Anybody else going to this concert? Your roommate? And McKinley. Maybe you guys know each other. Maybe not. I'm not going. I won't be there. But I know McKinley. So. Anybody studying biochemistry this, this weekend? No. No. Oh, there are some people. OK. Amazingly enough, we have one week left, and we're done. Isn't that scary? It is scary. Being done is not scary, but it's the final it is. Yeah, big week, big uh, Christmas, uh, Christmas, <laughs> spring break plans. What's that? Cider? Oh, right to presentation. Oh, okay. I don't feel like starting today. We should just maybe call off the class today. What do you guys think? And then we just do twice as much on Monday. <laughs> yes, no? I'm not going to call it off, but I'm just curious. If, if that were an option, how many would want to call off class today and have do, do, go twice as fast on Monday? Oh, God. <laughs> I shouldn't bring that up, right? What's that? I open the gate. Well, the gate's open. You can, you can go out the gate. <laughs> then I'll give extra credit to everybody that stays behind, you know, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, last time when I finished, I was talking about uh, this process here. And I was going through it a little hurriedly, so I'll come back and just very briefly take you through it again. Um, this process is important uh, for the targeting of proteins to various locations, either around the inside of the cell or uh, to be exported outside of the cell. Okay? And as I will show you in a minute, there's a, uh, a system for organizing and sorting those. But in order for them to be targeted for some place besides the cytoplasm or nucleus, nucleus has their own targeting uh, uh, sequences, um, there is a, um, uh, a signal that is found on the uh, amino terminus of proteins that tells the cell this protein is destined to go somewhere. So I showed you that sequence last time. And the sequence itself isn't um, overly important uh, because, for one, it's not, cons it's not a, a rigidly conserved sequence. It's just a general sequence. But when that sequence is recognized, it brings about the process that you see um, on the screen here. And what this process is doing is it's moving the translating protein to the endoplasmic reticulum. So we see here this, se this signal sequence that is uh, recognized, and it's this recognition of the signal sequence by this protein called SRP, the signal recognition protein. And when it recognizes that protein, that, that signal, as you can see here, it binds to it. And the binding of the SRP to the uh, amino terminus of that protein brings the uh, protein, the ribosome, the messenger RNA, the whole thing down to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. That's what gives rise to that, what we described last time as rough endoplasmic reticulum, where you see those little dots surrounding the endoplasmic reticulum, because those are ribosomes with messenger RNAs hanging off of them. At that point, um, once this makes it down to the uh, membrane of the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the um, SRP basically transfers the uh, protein being made into this little um, uh, protein with a hole in it called a translocon. And you can see that the transfer here has been made. The SRP has left. The SRP, you will notice, is a, uh, a G protein. And so it cleaves GTP and leaves, as we've seen other G proteins do, leaving behind the uh, protein being translated. Well, that protein continues being translated. It goes in further. And there is something called a signal peptidase that cuts off that signal. So the only function of that signal is to be recognized by the SRP to bring everything down to the endoplasmic reticulum. The signal itself gets cleaved off, and a, the rest of the protein then is continued to be made, and it eventually folds. Now, one of the consequences of this, you'll notice, is if we cut off the uh, signal uh, sequence off of that protein, that what's left behind most likely is not going to start with methionine. Okay? Because the methionine was on here, and unless we've coincidentally cut it at the place where there is a methionine, this very first amino acid that we see on this protein 
is not a methionine. So I tell you that because occasionally questions on exams and things like that come up where somebody says, hey, there is not a methionine at the end of this protein. What's wrong? What happened? Well, having seen this, this is one of many things that can happen to give a protein that doesn't have a methionine at the end. Okay. Well, when this whole process is done, the ribosome gets released, the messenger RNA gets released, just as we've seen before, and everybody goes back along their merry way. Meanwhile, this protein that was made folds in the um, uh, interior of the endoplasmic reticulum, called the endoplasmic reticular, reticulum lumen. And within there, this um, uh, endoplasmic reticulum will eventually bud off and make various things. So one of the buds can go and fuse with the, with the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus can either export things elsewhere into the cell, such as into the lysosome, or the Golgi apparatus can bud off little blebs that go to the surface of the cell, and the contents of that little bleb that goes to the surface can be released extracellularly. So we can see as a result of this that these uh, proteins that get put into the endoplasmic reticulum can go to a variety of places uh, within uh, a cell. And it all happens because of that signal peptidase. Yes? Well, uh, ER always goes to Golgi, or it can butt off and go somewhere else. It can actually go somewhere else as well. So, but for our purposes here, we're just, I'm just showing you Golgi. Okay? Okay. Uh, so that is um, that process. That finishes off the process of translation. And we move now to talking about the phenomenon of gene expression. So uh, you might have thought we talked about gene expression earlier when I talked about transcription. But the transcription that I talked about before was transcription at a very simple level, at a very general level. Now I'm going to talk about transcription in some more depth. And I want to remind you that gene expression is not simply transcription. Gene expression includes things like transcription, the stability of the transcript, the efficiency with which that transcript is translated, the stability of the protein that's made, a variety of factors contribute to that. So what gene expression is ultimately involved or ultimately describes is the amount of functional protein that is made. The amount of functional protein. So all those things I just described to you are variables in determining how much functional protein is actually made. Okay? So that's a very important uh, consideration. If we look, oh, blast it, bad link, okay, I'll fix that. Uh, what I started to show you was a table that compared the gene expression of the pancreas and the liver. And if we compare those two, we just see that there are no proteins that show up as the most abundant in one that shows up in the, in the most abundant of the other. In fact, if you go all the way through the top 10, there's no two proteins that are the same. And that's something that makes sense because these are organs that have individual functions. The liver participates, as you've seen, in a variety of functions, including sugar metabolism, fat metabolism, detoxification, whereas the pancreas is involved in digestion. And so we might expect that they might have a different pattern of protein expression between the two or, uh, organs in our body, and they are very different. So part of what gene expression is about is helping us to understand how it is that cells make different amounts of proteins in different cells. Ultimately, what we're interested in is how it is that a given cell is responding to the environment in which it's found how much a given cell is responding to the environment in which it's found. For a cell in a multicellular organism like ourselves, right, that environment doesn't change a lot with, as we think about temperature and so on and so forth, but it does change a lot when we think about it in terms of hormones and things that are secreted. You've already seen this, for example, with glycogen metabolism. You saw epinephrine binding cause glycogen to be broken down. You saw insulin binding cause glycogen to be made. Okay? There are many controls on cells like that. In prokaryotes, it's a very different kind of a scenario because in the prokaryotic world, every cell is for itself. Every cell is for itself. So it's looking out for number one. It's not responding to hormones. It's not ta they're not talking to each other for the most part. That is, the cells are not talking to each other for the most part. 
but the cell that's way over there in that corner is sitting in a very dusty, dirty environment. The cell that's sitting up here on this table is not sitting in the same environment. There might be more food and resources for that cell over there than there is for this cell over here. And so the cell over here that can adapt to this environment is going to be in good shape. The cell that can adapt to that environment is going to be in good shape. And cells that can't adapt to those environments aren't going to survive. So being able to adapt to the environment is a very, very critical function of a cell, whether that cell is in a multicellular organism or whether that cell is an individual bacterium that's floating out in the real world. We'll start with prokaryotes, and we're going to talk about prokaryotes with one simple, uh, relatively simple uh, gene system called the LAC operon. And I'm going to tell you about that. It's the, it's the classic uh, study of gene expression in um, E. coli. It's the most studied gene expression system in all of bacteria. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through that and telling you about it. Because it really does tell us a lot about how other um, operons themselves are controlled. All right, well, first I want to define the term operon. All right? So an operon, I mentioned it to you before, but I'm going to define it for you formally here. And the definition of an operon is a collection of genes all under the control of the same promoter. An operon is a collection of genes all under the control of the same promoter, meaning one promoter drives the transcription of all of the genes within it. Now what that means, therefore, is that there's one promoter, there must be one terminator as well, and in between that promoter and that terminator will be located all of the genes of the operon. Okay? In the case of the LAC operon, there are three genes that are of interest. They're called the LAC Z, Y, and A. Those letters aren't really critical for our purposes. They code three proteins, two of which we'll talk about here, one of which really doesn't have much significance for the control of gene expression uh, here. But it is related to lactose. So, a bacterium that's floating around um, in my gut, for example, all right, a bacterium that's floating around in my gut goes through periods where I eat and the bacterium says, yummy, 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 there's all kinds of food, and when I go on a diet, as yes, I'm finally on a diet again, when I go on a diet and I'm not eating so much, that bacterium is going, man, I'm hungry, I'm taking food away from Ahern or something because I've got to stay alive, right? Imagine how Ahern feels, right? Okay. So, anyway, this bacterium has a variety of food environments that it finds itself in. Okay? I'm not a big drinker of milk. I don't drink hardly any milk. And milk is a very good source of lactose. Okay? If I go uh, several days without drinking milk, all right, I'm getting plenty of uh, energy, maybe glucose, maybe sucrose, fatty acids, a variety of things that the bacterium can grab and use for its own energy sources, but no lactose. If I'm not giving lactose or not intaking lactose in my system, there's not any good reason for the bacterium to make enzymes to break down lactose. Because if it's making those enzymes at any appreciable level, what it's doing is it's wasting energy. Okay? If it's making those enzymes at any appreciable level, it's wasting energy. On the other hand, if I decide to go to the gelato place tonight, which I happen to love to go to, and I get some dairy there, then what I... Um, <laughs> now I was just trying to decide whether to tell a joke or not, but I'll, I'll save the joke for a minute. <laughs> tell it? <laughs> okay, it's Friday. That's kind of a rude joke, okay? It's not really a joke, but it's a bumper sticker. Maybe you guys have heard of this bumper sticker, okay? In, in, uh, in Wisconsin, they supposedly have this bumper sticker, and it says, come smell our dairy air. <laughs> okay. Dairy air, you see. Not, never mind. All right. Anyway. Yeah, that was bad, I know. Okay. All right. So anyway, I, I, I eat some dairy. I'm getting some lactose in there. Those bacteria that are in my stomach going, hey, there's lactose. Lactose is really a good source of energy. Let's break that down. So then when that lactose is present, it would be nice for those bacteria to be able to start making enzymes and breaking it down. And that's what the lac operon allows them to do. 
it allows them to pretty much turn off, it never turns it off absolutely, but to pretty much turn off the expression of the operon when there's no lactose and to turn on the expression when lactose is present. Okay? This is what we call inducible expression. Inducible. All right? In this case, the induction is caused ultimately by the presence of lactose. So lactose is inducing the expression of genes that will metabolize lactose. OK, so the operon consists, as I said, of three genes. LACZ is a gene that's known as beta-galactosidase. Yes, that's a name I think you should know, beta-galactosidase. That's actually, for our purposes, the most important enzyme in the operon. It does two things. One, it, convert, it, it catalyzes the breakdown of lactose into glucose and galactose. Well, that's really useful because glucose and galactose are great sources of energy. You have a question? Yeah, this enzyme is related to what is this disease? Lac-Z. This is Lac-Z. Beta-galactosidase is Lac-Z. Okay? Now, we'll see Lac-Z actually, or beta-galactosidase, same thing, has uh, some other useful functions for us. Okay? Now, the first thing I said was it breaks down lactose into galactose and glucose. The second thing that LACZ does is, as a, a, a side reaction, it occasionally makes a product called allolactose that has a slightly different structure than lactose. Allolactose, A-L-L-O-L-A-C-T-O-S-E. Okay? That's the two things that beta-galactosidase does. The second gene that's of interest to us is the, the, uh, is labeled Y up there. And Y is an enzyme that we call a permease. What do you suppose a permease does? It lets lactose inside the cell. So it's a, it's a little membrane protein that is specific for lactose and allows lactose to come into the cell. LAC-A is the least important gene for our purposes, and I'm not going to talk about it here. It makes something that that is, a, is formed on lactose that uh, basically isn't really relevant for our purposes, okay? So lac Z and lac Y will be the two of interest to us. All right, now, as I look at this, I can see that there are two things here up here called control sites. The control sites are part of the promoter. They're part of what we call the operator, the lac operator. And we'll see that that operator includes a binding site for RNA polymerase. And it also includes binding sites for two other proteins. Now, the last thing I'll show you up here, and you say, well, what's that I over there, Ahern? You said there are three genes. Well, there are three genes. There's the promoter right there. That is the binding site for the RNA polymerase. There's the O, which is where one of the proteins binds. All right? And the three genes are downstream, that is to the right, of the promoter. When transcription starts, it's going to start here and move rightwards. Okay? This gene is not part of the operon. However, it's related in the sense that the product of this gene is a protein called the LAC repressor. The LAC repressor. And again, LAC is L-A-C. What the LAC repressor does is it binds to that O sequence, that operator sequence right there. Okay? And we'll see how that functions in a bit. But the, this I gene is not part of the operon. It just happens to be next to it. it. Just happens to be next to it. Okay, well, let's take a look at how this gene, uh, how this operon actually functions. Okay? Uh, but uh, let's see, we don't want to see sequences. Let's not look at that. Um, here, practically, is what happens in the cell. And it's showing you graphically what I told you happened in words. That is, the cell sitting around, there's no lactose present. If we measure the amount of beta-galactosidase being produced by the cell, we discover it's essentially zero. All right? essentially zero, pretty close to zero, 
maybe that might have some trace amount, but not very much that's there. When we add lactose, however, we see that the amount of beta-galactosidase made increases fairly rapidly and goes up here to the point where lactose is removed. Okay? When that happens, then everything kind of flattens out. All right? This is the induction of this, the synthesis of beta-galactosidase, and that induction is caused by lactose, the presence of lactose. Okay. Um, what was I? Oh. Um, pressed. Here. Okay. Now, this shows the, oper the, the lac operon as it exists when there is no lactose in the cell. Okay? Or there's no lactose to be found. There's no lactose around. The operator looks like this. Now, you see there are two little purple proteins sitting there on the O. The operator has two copies of the lac repressor. The lac repressor's job is to bind to that sequence. And you'll notice the way they've positioned those proteins, that the two proteins are actually extending beyond that operator O. They're actually extending into the promoter, which is where the RNA polymerase would bind. Because the repressor covers up a little bit of the promoter, the RNA polymerase cannot bind, and therefore transcription cannot occur. Okay? So in this case, the operon is turned off. RNA is not made. Okay? No lac Z, no lac Y, no lac A. All right? And everything is turned off. Now, if the cell encounters a little bit of lactose, all right, two things can happen. One is there's always a little bit of permease present, plus lactose itself can make it across the membrane with low efficiency. All right? So when the cell encounters lactose, a little bit of that lactose makes it into the cell. And that little bit of lactose inside the cell gets converted by the little bit of beta-galactosidase that also happens to be in the cell. Remember I said it wasn't all the way down to zero. And it makes this molecule called allolactose. Now allolactose turns out to be very important because allolactose can bind to the lac repressor. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat that. So. We have some lactose that the cell encounters. A little bit of that lactose makes it into the cell by whatever means necessary. The small amount of beta-galactosidase that's there converts the lactose into allolactose. And the allolactose binds to the lac repressor. It's a sort of a sequence of events that just happened. When the lac repressor binds to allolactose, the lac repressor can no longer bind to the operator. The lac repressor binds to allolactose. The lac repressor can no longer bind to the operator. Well, that means now that this site is going to be wide open. And when it's wide open, guess what? The RNA polymerase can come in and can bind to its promoter site, and transcription can start. So this is how the induction happens. Lactose, the presence of lactose, tells the cell, you better start making the proteins in this operon, and it does by binding to the lac repressor. It's a very simple system. Now, we'll see there's one more level of complexity to it, all right? But for all practical purposes, this is how it works. Questions about that before I move on? Yes, Eric. Okay, so when allolactose binds the repressor, is that a covalent binding? The answer is it is not a covalent binding. Like almost all the other bindings to proteins, it's a reversible binding. That's right. Yes? Yep. Okay, so his question is, given the proximity of this to the, uh, of the lac 
um, I gene to this, does it immediately leave from here and go boing over here and bind or not? It can do both. Keep in mind that in prokaryotes, which is what we're talking about here, transcription and translation are occurring at the same time. So as this guy is being made, translation has already started, so the protein is pretty much coming out at about the place where it's going to be needed. It doesn't have to go directly there, but it, it, it probably most commonly does, yes. Okay. I should point out that this promoter right here for the eye is not inducible. It's always on at a low level. And that makes sense, because the cell will always want to have the repressor present. It wants to be able to turn things off. I'll be just a second. It wants to turn things off when lactose goes away, so that having the repressor present to do that makes some sense. Question? Allolactose, not allolactase, but allolactose is a molecule that the CAP is a protein that I'm going to describe in a minute. You get your, but, but good, I'm glad you're reading ahead. Yes? Um, if somebody is lactose intolerant, does it have something to do with sequencing eyes, so it just binds and never unbinds? Okay, so the question is about lactose intolerance. Remember, this is in bacteria, so we're not talking about, we're not talking, this, this is not a human system. So hum, in humans, we're talking about the enzyme lactase, which breaks down uh, lactose, and that's a different, a completely different uh, induction system. Uh, question up here, if I see a hand. Okay, all right, so this is um, how this system operates. As I said, it operates in a pretty straightforward uh, fashion, okay? Now, what beta-galactosidase actually does, I think I described to you in words, but you can see it again here. Here's lactose. There's the enzyme beta-galactosidase. It's breaking down galact into galactose and glucose, as you can see here, okay? And... Um, this is allolactose. As I said, it's, it's sort of a variant of lactose that's there. You don't need to know that structure. I'll just showing it to you for your information. And the other thing I want to show you is, well, once the alpyrine gets induced, what happens? Okay, so when the alpyrine gets induced, there's the allolactose, comes, binds, and when it binds, it can't bind. The, the lacropressor can no longer bind to the operator, and consequently, transcription starts. We then make these, not we, but the bacteria then make these three genes. Now, uh, there is another protein that plays a role in this process, and it's called CAP, okay? C-A-P. It's also in some places called C-R-P, okay? But C-A-P, C-R-P, same protein as far as we're concerned. Why is there another protein involved, okay? Oh, well, there's another protein involved because if we look at the sequences that are involved, okay? We see that we don't have something that is a, is a really good match for that consensus promoter sequence that E. coli had. Remember, in E. coli, it was TAA, TAAT. This is AATTGT, okay? And there it is repeated over there, all right? It's not a great promoter, meaning that the RNA polymerase is not going to be real efficient in terms of binding to it and making messenger RNA. It'll make some. But we saw that protein level of beta-galactosidase go way up. How does it go way up? Well, that's where the cap protein gets involved. The cap protein helps the RNA polymerase to bind. Okay? It helps it to bind. Now, to orient you on here, here is the protein called CAP. Okay? CAP binds to a molecule that you've seen before. It binds to cyclic AMP. And when it binds to cyclic AMP, this protein, CAP, can then bind to a region ahead of the promoter. Ahead of. Now I'm using ahead of, meaning 5 prime to the promoter. When it binds to that region ahead of the promoter, instead of covering up the promoter like the repressor did, the cap protein actually helps RNA polymerase to bind. The effect of this, then, is that transcription gets jump-started. The combination of these two make that lac operon be transcribed at very high levels, and consequently, very high levels of the beta-galactosidase and other genes is consequently made. Orienting you on here, Here's the cap binding site. Here's the RNA polymerase binding site. And down here is where that O would have been. 
Okay? Cap, polymerase, and then there's the lac repressor O binding site down here. The question then arises as to what happens if the cell has cap protein bound here and the lac repressor bound down here. Will transcription be favored, not favored, somewhere in between? What do you think? It will be not favored. And the reason it will be favored is because the repressor is still binding and covering part of the promoter. So when they both bind, the repressor wins. Therefore, it's all the more important that the removal of that repressor is the, is the main control for the gene. The removal of that repressor now allows the cap protein to do its thing and allows the RNA polymerase to bind and go and do transcription. Okay, pretty cool. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about two artificial molecules we use to study this promoter, but before I do that again, I'll stop and see if you have any questions. Yes, sir? What's the point that the uh, bacterial genome, specifically with this case, has this unfavorable sequence, so it takes extra energy to involve another protein to bind you know, RNA pole? Okay. Is it just a random mutation? Or? Sure. So his question is, why does the cell have this setup where it's got a promoter that's not very efficient? And it's taking another protein to make the transcription efficient. Is that, that basically it? Yes. OK. So it's a, it's a good question. And, and the answer to the question, all we can do is speculate in all of these, of course. But the answer to the question is that this gives cells more control, not less. So for example, there are times when cells are making cyclic AMP and other times when they're not. You've seen this in eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, it's a little bit different. But there are times when it's making it and times when it's not. Let's imagine that we have cyclic AMP that is an indicator of low energy. If cyclic AMP is indicating low energy, then when cyclic AMP is being made, we would expect to have more cap binding and more transcription, right, if lactose is present. On the other hand, if the cell has plenty of energy and it encounters lactose, it doesn't need lactose. It doesn't need the, the beta galactosidase in any large amounts. So it could have transcription going at a lower level. Does that help a little bit? OK. So what we see is a modulation that is control of the amount of transcription that's happening. Now, this is a very simple kind of modulation. In eukaryotic cells, it's very elaborate. And it's made very elaborate by virtue of the fact that there are many transcription uh, factors that are controlling transcription in eukaryotic cells. But having that ability to go up, down, and change according to the needs of the cell is a very important consideration. And that's what's also helping the cell to adapt to the environment in which it finds itself. OK, other questions? Yes? Does the cap bind to an enhancer sequence here? Um, your book occasionally refers to enhancer sequences in bacteria. I don't use that because it's a different kind of a meaning in bacteria than it is in human cells. So the answer is no, it does not. OK? OK, um, so I want to talk about two other molecules. One is a molecule you've, you've seen. I mentioned it briefly last term. It's called um, XGAL. You'll see it again later this term. And we, we use it as an indicator. So I want to remind you what XGAL does. XGAL is a an artificial substrate for beta-galactosidase. It's an artificial substrate, meaning that it's not lactose, but the enzyme will still act on it. It's a man-made molecule. I've said scientists are lazy, right? Last term I talked about how we used a molecule that serine protease cut and produced a yellow color. Remember that? All right. XGAL is a molecule that beta-galactosidase will cut, and when it cuts it, it produces a molecule with a blue color. Now this turns out to be really, really useful. Because like I said, biochemists are lazy people, and because biochemists are lazy people, if I want to know how much beta-galactosidase is being made, all I have to do is add some XGAL to the cells, they will start making blue color, and the amount of blue that I get is a measure of how much beta-galactosidase was being made. 
The intensity of the blue tells me very quickly and easily how much beta-galactosidase is being made. So that induction that I showed you before, where we saw the, the uh, line going up as lactose was added, the beta-galactosidase uh, activity was increasing, I could have done that experiment using XGAL very easily. That's one artificial molecule we use to study this operon, and more importantly, we use it to measure the amount of beta-galactosidase, which is a part of that operon. Okay? Second artificial molecule that we use is interesting. Okay? It's called IPTG. There is its full name if you want to memorize its full name. And no, I won't use that full name. I will only use IPTG. Okay? IPTG okay, looks like this. And you think, what the hell is that? All right? Well, this guy confuses the LAC repressor. The LAC repressor looks at it and thinks, believe it or not, it's allolactose. It will bind to this guy, and when it binds to this guy, the repressor will no longer bind to the operator, and the operon will be induced. All right? Now, why do we use this? This is what we call an artificial inducer of the operon. It's a man-made molecule. Why do we use an artificial inducer? Why don't we just dump allolactose into the, into the system? The reason? Because cells will metabolize allolactose. So I might add a fixed amount, but over time, the amount is going to change. Now, if I want to know how well I can induce the operon, I don't want my material changing in concentration over time. This will not be metabolized by the cell. I put it in there, that cell is going to have its lac operon activated, and it's not going to be turned off. Well, that could be really useful, for example, if I want bacteria to make a lot of a protein of my interest. Let's say I decide I want the bacteria to make human growth hormone. And I take the lac operator region, and I put it in front of the human growth hormone. I throw it into a bacterium. I give the bacterium IPTG. What's going to happen? It's going to induce the operon, and it's going to make a ton of human growth hormone, and it's not going to stop. If I gave it allolactose, eventually it'll stop. So this turns out to be really useful for inducing an operon and making it go on. So this it's obviously specific for this operon because it's specific for binding to the lac repressor. Yes, sir? Will the cell only metabolize allolactose after it's finished metabolizing lactose? That will predominantly be when that happens, but it's, it, it can still handle it at any time. Yeah. Yes? Say it again. Same process as clone screening. You can use this as a method for determining if you've got a plasma that you've inserted that has a, a, an insert into it. And that's why I mentioned it last term in, 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 the, in the biotechnology section. Yes, yes, you can. It's called blue-white screening. So that's, it, that, that's the blue is coming from this. Was there another hand? Yes. Okay, so her question is, uh, does, is the, is the X-GAL an accurate measure of the amount of beta-galactosidase since the beta-galactosidase can also bind to um, the um, uh, lactose that's there? That's actually a, a very good question. In general, you would set this up so that the cell wasn't exposed to lactose. So you're right, the amount of lactose would confuse that process considerably. But in this case, you're not giving the cell uh, lactose so that there's not a cross uh, reactivity with that. OK? Very good question. Yes? These are all prokaryotes. We're talking E. coli purely right now. Yeah, but prokaryotes in general. Yes? Yes?
Okay, so his question is, if I'm not using lactose, how do I get this, 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 this um, uh, system induced? That's what the IPTG is for. So the IPTG will induce, that's that artificial inducer, it will induce the operon to start producing beta-galactosides. I don't have to have lactose to do that. So that's one, another reason that we're using IPTG is we don't want lactose confusing the system for the purpose of, of, of uh, uh, confusing how much the enzyme is working and also having variable amounts of stuff over time. Does that make sense? Good, good question. Do you also have to starve the cell so that it's making cyclic AMP? I use starvation as an example. I'm not necessarily starving the cell to do that. Okay. Um, so, uh, no, I don't have to starve the cell to do that. Okay. But I was using starvation simply as, as an example of an, where an induction relevant to that might make sense. Okay. Uh, cyclic AMP in prokaryotic cells is more complicated than it is in eukaryotes. In some cases, it could actually indicate starvation. Okay. Okay. Good questions, as always. You guys, are, like I said, are the best questioning class I've ever had. There's the lac repressor, and there's CAP. Memorize those structures, right? All right. The last thing I want to say about prokaryotic systems um, is to turn away from the lac repressor and talk about another really odd, although common, system for controlling gene expression. It's called attenuation. And attenuation is very odd, OK? It's very odd. It's a little hard to describe. I always struggle with this a little bit, all right? I'm showing you this figure. And I'm, the attenuation happens with operons that are for the synthesis of amino acids. So bacteria have to make most of their amino acids. And it's a series of proteins that it takes in each operon to make any given amino acid. Okay. So bacteria have to make their own amino acids from scratch. And there are a series of enzymes for any given amino acid that's necessary to make a given amino acid. Since those enzymes are all used for the same purpose, let's say for making tryptophan, it makes sense that they're all in the same operon. If the cell has plenty of tryptophan, it can turn off the operon and not uh, be making it. If the cell is short of tryptophan, then it'd want to make the operon so that it could synthesize more. So having all those genes on a single operon makes some sense. It's not just true for tryptophan. It's true for several of the operons for making amino acids. All right. Now, the tryptophan operon is very long. There are 10 genes in the tryptophan operon. If we think about the cell going through and making a messenger RNA that can, encompasses all of the genes of the tryptophan operon from one end to the other, all right, if, we, if each gene is on the order of, let's say, 3,000 bases, then we're talking about a messenger RNA that's 30,000 bases long. And it's taking two ATPs, or two triphosphates for each one, because remember, two phosphates gets clipped off every time we put one of those in. So we're talking 60,000 triphosphates to make one copy of one operon. Energetically, that's very expensive. Cells don't want to do that unless they need it. So what they do is they have a built-in system that allows them to sense what their level of tryptophan is. We can look at it and say, well, its level is low. Because we can measure it. Cells can't measure it. Cells have to sense it in some way. Well, they sense it using this system I'm getting ready to describe to you. OK? All right. Now, if we look at this um, operon, okay, we see that there is a short peptide that is at the very beginning of it. This is the very first protein in that operon. And that's the complete sequence of that first protein. This first protein doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. Why does the operon, which the cell is already, the cell is already worried about energy, why does it make a protein that doesn't do anything? Well, it's the translation of this protein that helps the cell to understand if it has sufficient tryptophan or not. How does it do it? 
Well, remember, transcription and translation in prokaryotes are happening in the same place at the same time, right? That's number one. So as soon as the RNA polymerase starts spitting out this messenger RNA, the ribosomes come along and say, oh, I'm going to start translating this, and I'm going to start following that polymerase, which is up here. Okay? All right. So that's one thing, all right? The ribosome gets up here, and it encounters in this sequence a sequence of two tryptophans. Let's imagine what happens when the ribosome hits those two tryptophans. If there's a low amount of tryptophan, the ribosome is going to slow down and wait for tryptophan on a transfer RNA to make it in there. If there's a low concentration of that, it's going to take it longer. Right? So if that happens, the ribosome is going to pause right in this area. It's going to sit there and it's going to wait until tryptophan gets there. All right? Let's imagine tryptophan is abundant. If the cell has plenty of tryptophan, then the transfer RNA for tryptophan comes in, it binds, and the ribosome goes merrily along its way. Okay? We have two different situations, pause or no pause. And we're talking about the ribosome. Okay? Pause or no pause? Okay. Now, we look at the sequence, we discover that there's a, 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 um, a, a, a um, nucleotide sequence in there called an attenuator. That attenuator can form two different structures. One structure is right here, and one structure is over here. Okay? This structure that you see on the right is what we call a transcriptional terminator. This structure on the left is not a terminator. Okay? So we have a possibility between two different structures that can, that can form here. All right? Let's imagine we've got the situation where the, we, have, we have plenty of tryptophan. The ribosome moves very quickly through that tryptophan sequence, and it encounters the red sequence up here and binds to it. The red sequence being, wish I had it on the same on the same slide, uh, the red sequence being right here. Okay, so if there's plenty of tryptophan, the ribosome makes it through that tryptophan sequence and binds right here, right? So it just slides through all this stuff and it gets up here and it's on the attenuator. It didn't stop here, meaning that the ribosome is very close to the RNA polymerase. Okay. When it binds to this, it covers up and prevents this red sequence from forming. The red sequence, I didn't tell you, but the red sequence is what we call an anti-terminator. The blue sequence is a terminator. You will only get one, or the cell will only get one or the other. So if the ribosome is moving fast, the ribosome gets here, a terminator forms, and transcription stops. If the ribosome goes slow, it doesn't get up to the red sequence, it sits here and stops, the anti-terminator forms, meaning that the terminator itself can't form, and what happens? The RNA polymerase continues. All right? Either continues or doesn't continue. That's the two possibilities. Now, I know that's confusing, so I'm going to repeat that to you next time. In the meantime, I have one song to go out for the weekend with. It's a song I've never sung to class before, so I hope you'll sing loud, because I haven't been hearing you guys sing loud. There's not a lot of you here today. It's called God Bless These Complexes. All information in cells' DNA Just increases with pieces Mixed and matched in the mRNAs Linking axons all together Using SNRPs in complexes. God bless the spliceosome and transcriptomes. God bless the spliceosome.
lysosomes and my genome. Your blue blueprint info is <laughs> your blueprint info is in DNA. Since you need it, proofread it, or you'll mutate the mRNA. You can translate all the codons with the cell's genetic code. God bless the ribosomes, they translate code. God bless the ribosomes and proteomes. All right, guys. <laughs>